Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we've got another video with my nemesis here. One of Battleship New Jersey's 16 inch gun barrels, which was removed in the 1950s to be relined. So, this video is in response to a question from a viewer like you. Uh, actually, we're gonna answer two different viewers' questions here. Uh, the first one has to do with the number of barrels made. So the U.S. Navy didn't make extra barrels for the ships intentionally. Uh, each battleship got the designated number of barrels. These barrels were all made at the Washington Navy Yard, uh, where they had a huge gun foundry. With the Iowas, there were two ships that were canceled. And then the Montana class battleship subsequent, which had been authorized and which had gun barrels started to be made because they're a really long lead time item. Uh, but none of those ships were ever laid down. And so the Navy stopped construction of gun barrels, but they still had a bunch of these Mark seven rifles laying around. And so they kept them in the inventory. So normally when a ship goes into the yard, after it's fired, however many shots, about 300 uh, for the Iowa's in World War II and had to be relined. They would pull the barrel, reline it, takes about two months, and then send it right back while the ship was still in the yard. Uh, that is not what the Navy did with these ships in the 50s when they relined their barrels because they had plenty laying around. So they took the old ones out, dropped new ones in right away, reline the old ones and then put them in the inventory in case they ever had to reline them. Now, additives added over the ship's career to the powder made it so that relining didn't have to happen every 300 shots. And by the 80s, it was like every 1500 shots, which was way more than the lifetime of a battleship. If you want to hear more about that, here's a link to a video where we talk about uh, the number of shots needed before relining. So, making an actual gun barrel. The first thing you do is you make your tube, which is this outer ring here. Just a big solid piece of metal and you bore it out. It's like a giant drill press. I should mention the Washington Navy Yard doesn't make guns like this anymore. That There is no naval gun factory there. Uh, the Navy's museum is in one of the buildings from that with the big overhead gantry crane still in place. So if you ever go and visit there, take a look up and check it out. And we don't make guns in this fashion anymore. So from right before the Civil War, all the way up through the 1950s and 60s, when we made guns, you would wrap other bands of metal around the guns, particularly at the breach where you've got all the high pressure building up behind the projectile when the gun goes off. Well, nowadays, metallurgy is at the point and guns are small enough that they can just cast that entire gun as one thing. Not so with these. You've got to cast them as several different um, tubes and then basically insert them into each other. Now, how do you do that? So here you can see two different parts. You've got the tube and the liner. The liner has the rifling and this is what would be removed every time you had to um, change it out. The rifling wears down over shots. So the tube is lowered into a huge pit at the gun foundry. And that huge pit is filled with electric heaters. Uh, so it heats up the entire tube and causes it to expand. Then they start to insert the jacket into the tube and they're pumping cold water into the jacket to cause it to contract a little bit and so they can force it inside and then they turn off the heaters they turn off the uh, water and these try to return to their normal size and they basically contract and expand into each other and then they're locked in place there's no welds or anything holding these together at all now when you want to remove this you do the same thing in reverse you put the gun back in the hole you heat it up, you cool this down, and then you've got enough wiggle room to pull this out. 
So without going into the breech mechanism, the barrel, which is this whole assembly here, is made up of several components. The liner, the rifling we've already talked about, the tube, which is the main part of the barrel you think of, the jacket, which goes around the tube on the breech end. It's got three hoops, of which this is one, and those uh, build up the back end where the most pressure is. It's got two locking rings, a tube and liner locking ring, a yoke ring, and a screw box ring. You can see that back here, the back part of the gun is not rifled. This is where the shells and the powder go, and so it can stay smooth. So the um, liner does not extend this far back. Here's the screw box liner, which is all the threading where the breech would lock into when this is closed. Here you can see some of the hoops as they build up as you get further back in the gun. The pressure from the explosion is built up behind the shell, which is gripping the liner. And so the bulk of the forces are back here. And by the time the shell has been pushed this far out here, a lot of those forces have been expended, and so the barrel can get narrower. Uh, and that saves weight. Remember, the battleship was weight restricted as initially designed. If you're interested in reading more about this, there's a link to a PDF in the description below. Uh, this PDF is from 1987, and it uh, talks about how you would reline and uh, replace these barrels in the 80s if something happened to them. Flip to page 20 for that part. If you want to see more content on the 16-inch gun barrels and why I called it my nemesis, uh, check out this video of me crawling through this particular 16-inch gun barrel. Otherwise, if you have questions about uh, stuff you'd like to see on our channel, drop them in the comment section down below. We'll get back to you. Maybe like these viewer questions, we'll make a separate video about them. If you like the work we do and are interested in our content, please consider donating to support the museum. There's a link in the description to our GoFundMe campaign, and anything you put into there not only supports the museum, it directly supports our YouTube channel and the content we create. We do also receive support from the New Jersey Department of State. We try to release new content several times a week, so like, share, and subscribe so that you don't miss anything.